Welcome everyone to day two of CopperCon. This uh, agenda for today will primarily focus on system science, complexity, and de-implementation. And we'll be kicking off this morning with an opening keynote address from Dr. Dr. Kristen hasmiller lich um, from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, who will be presenting on making complexity pragmatic again and practical steps to systems mapping and modeling. Dr. Hasmiller-Lich is an Associate Professor of Health Policy and Management in the Gilling School of Global Public Health at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. She specializes in the application of qualitative system mapping, operations research, and complex systems simulation modeling to inform and improve the population-level impact of healthcare delivery, policy, and efforts of cross-sector collaborations seeking to improve health. As a methodologist, she has worked on a variety of problems spanning substance use, cancer prevention, injury and violence prevention, mental health system strengthening, road safety, and maternal and child health. Her research passion is to advance the way we use system maps, models, both qualitative and quantitative, and local data with stakeholders to improve understanding of complex systems and to inform policy and practice. In addition to teaching these methods at UNC, and through the Washington University System Science for Social Impact Summer Training Program, she has been invited to introduce and train on the use of system science methods in a variety of settings, including the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the World Health Organization, the National Institutes of Health, and the Veterans Health Administration. She serves as a systems core lead on the HRSA-funded National Maternal and Child Health Workforce Development Center, developing system science capacity among maternal and child health, um, and with colleagues, she recently published the first primer, Complex Systems and Populations Health in 2020 from Oxford University Press. We are absolutely delighted to have you presenting here, uh, Dr. hasmiller lich I'm really looking forward to this presentation to give us all an orientation to systems mapping and modeling. And with that, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, great. It is such an honor to be here with you today. This conference is fantastic and it's such a good way. I, I wish that you know, I look forward to the day when we can all be in person uh, having all the side conversations and, and learning from each other's work. I'm glad to be here with you all virtually. Um, I want to start and just give a little bit of a background on me and how I got into this to this kind of place doing this kind of work. Um, so I was cross trained first as a public health researcher. Um, a health services and organ organization and policy researcher. Um, and the other half as an engineer, an industrial and operations engineer. And that really affected how I saw the world and how I approached problems. Um, so I was really trained to listen for opportunities to leverage computer simulation modeling to support understanding and decision-making to improve health. And as I got working, early in my career very quickly came to appreciate that the, the there was that while there's value to this to this kind of quantitative simulation modeling there's also a real need to help people have conversations about complex issues that cross system boundaries that cross organizational lines sector lines that cross discipline disciplinary lines um, that before we can unleash the power of simulation modeling decision analysis we really need to help people come to an understanding about what the problems are you know, that they want to work on to develop a, a shared vocabulary. And so really over the last 15 years in my career, I feel like it's equal parts trying to use systems mapping to help different people come together and understand complex problems and also the simulation modeling. I think these are both very powerful um, tools and so I want today to try to do three things. Okay, first, um, in the spirit of the, the title I was asked to speak to, I wanna share my top 10 tips for making complexity pragmatic, for, for, for really trying to help you um, uh, frame projects that, that bring methods that can accommodate real world complexity to make them feel digestible and, you know, and doable. Um, I also, as I talk through these tips, want to expose you to diverse systems mapping and modeling methods. There's not just one approach to doing this. There are a lot of approaches. And I think there's also a lot of room to innovate on the approaches. 
So I want to expose you to a bunch of different approaches, but also encourage an openness of mind to the diversity of approaches. These methods can be hard, and so we tend to learn and get good at what we know, but that doesn't mean it's always the right systems approach. So I want to encourage this openness. Um, I also want to begin to introduce a broad set of systems mapping and modeling uh, projects, applications that I've worked on over the years, um, because I hope that there's something in here that you can connect to that feels useful. I'm trying to introduce these concepts in the context of real projects, uh, not going into huge depth on any of them, but I tried to pick projects where there's good resources to read more online. And please don't hesitate to contact me if you want to talk about any of this further. Okay, so without further ado, let's dive in. Um, I mean, in no way to disparage this important work by the Foresight Group, here I'm showing some systems mapping around obesity and determinants of obesity. It's a picture that many of us see when we're first introduced to systems mapping, and there's a lot of really good work in here, but it can be incredibly overwhelming. And on my screen, this is looking a little blurry. Sorry, I hope it's not too blurry on yours. It can, it can feel overwhelming. And so sometimes, you know, um, it's not it, it's not it's not how we want to necessarily you know get started, right? We will get to this point of having to have kind of a big there's there's a lot going on in our systems methods, but there are a lot of approaches for trying to manage this sense of overwhelm, this complexity in a in a systematic way. So the first thing that I want to say, the first tip is that we want to focus on a problem or a desired change and not the system. Over time, through a series of projects, we might really start to get to this level of knowledge and there's value in putting it together, but it's often not where we start and it's not where we want to show that we're starting. So to that end, there are um, two ways that, that I encourage you to kind of pick a focus for our systems inquiry that will help you not feel overwhelmed right away. And also just trying to start here as a place to get you to think about how to step into this work. As I talk through this, you know, the, my recommendations for a starting point, and as I get into talking about what I mean by systems and systems thinking, I want you to think about a problem, a complex change initiative that you're interested in working on, and think about which of these ways, which, you know, which of these, how these definitions apply to your problem. I want you to be thinking about that as I go. So if we're trying to figure out how to get started, right, that we don't just map the system, um, one way is to identify a dynamic problem. And what I mean by that is a trend over time, a, a curve or a set of trends that, that is problematic, something we don't like, a curve or a set of curves that we want to bend. Here I'm showing you data on pedestrian fatalities. Um, they had gone down for many, many years, but around 2009, that, that decline slowed and it's been uh, numbers have been going up since, and it's gotten even worse since 2017. Um, some of you may be familiar with RBA, um, resource-based uh, accountability. Uh, that's often, it's, you know, it's centered, I'm sorry, result-based accountability. That's centered on this idea of bending curves. And, and it's the kind of idea that I'm talking about here. What are the curves that we wanna bend? We're not mapping everything that might matter. We're really trying to start to understand why do the curves, these trends look the way they look? Right. We're really trying to figure out what has created these changes that we want to um, that we want to alter. So for this pedestrian fatalities trend, what we want to do is not only look at what's been happening, but start to have conversations about what do we think this is going to look like at into the future? And what do we hope that it will look like? What is possible? And really start digging into trying to understand the system structure and you know, changes in kind of mental models, how people think about these problems. Um, try to think about how we need to change what we're doing to realize these different futures. So it's okay if your trend line, often I get asked what happens if the trend line is, that I'm interested in bending is flat. You know, we've been, the story is often we've been spending tremendous effort to try to improve things, but it's not working. That's fine. If your trend line is flat, let's try to think about what we've tried. Why has, what has worked? What hasn't worked? Is it that something else is happening to offset the benefits that we're, that we're creating? You know, is it that we're just not able to create the change that we expected? Why not? Let's learn from that. So a flat trend is still okay. The other way to step into a systems project and, and, and have it feel a little bit more bounded is to establish boundaries. 
So instead of trying to bend a curve, if what we're trying to do is think about how to implement a complex intervention or to change some narrow kind of scope of work or structure of a system, set boundaries so that we are very clear about what we're working on and don't start with everything. So, you know, boundaries, sometimes things that we might want to think about are the target population. Who are we targeting? And maybe there's a couple we might want to study how it's playing out in, in, or think about how to improve, um, you know, improve services or imp implement the intervention in separate uh, target populations. Who are the organizations that are partnering, partnering sorry, how um, broad versus narrow uh, of, a, of a scope are we taking in terms of kind of the who's doing what that's part of the system? What disciplines are we considering? And other, there are other ways to narrow the boundary, but just be really clear about the scope. Sometimes if we're thinking about a complex intervention, be really clear about where it starts and stops. But that's, that's a good way to think about the boundary, what's included. So the second tip here is that, is that if you're doing systems inquiry and you start to feel overwhelmed, remember to zoom in, narrow your scope. Try to get a, a sense of that first then before you then zoom back out and put that narrow look at things into perspective. Systems thinking is all about changing you know, the, the, the level of your inquiry over time. Sometimes we need to zoom in and study details you know, in the, the leaves. Um, to really understand what's going on there, but then we need to zoom back out. If we're starting zoomed out, we're by you know necessity, maybe taking a little bit more of a superficial look at things, but trying to understand the, the broader factors. Just remember to keep going back and forth. So if you start to feel overwhelmed, it's okay to zoom in and study a piece. And then once you get your head around that, zoom out and think about what, you know, in context, what affects that, and then go to the next deep dive. And our systems understanding starts to really grow. So the third tip is that I want to really encourage you when you're talking about systems inquiry um, to clarify and bring some structure to what you mean by system. So here's a definition I like to use. A system is a set of elements that are interconnected in a structure that produces outcomes that we care about. When I used to give talks on systems, often what people have in mind is uh, and something that can be described with an organizational structure diagram. And I don't mean just that, I mean way more than that. So there's lots of different systems that we can think about. A watch is a system that's made up of gears and materials, those are its components, and they work together to help us tell time. That's the purpose that we care about. A family or a household is a system that works together to navigate the world or to you know, raise children. There's lots of uh, outcomes that we care about in families. A state health department is a system that organizes resources, activities, and people to promote health and well-being. Um, so what's that system that is shaping the problem that you're working on or affecting your, changes, your change effort success in the most critical ways? This is what I want to encourage you to start to think about. Now back to the studying the system and not studying the system, but instead finding a, 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 a trend or, or a scoped uh, component of services to study. Two things that are just examples here. So if we were interested in a family or a household, right, um, we could start to talk about that as a system, but you could imagine how big this would get and how much heterogeneity there might be and how I do that versus you do that. So instead, we want to think about some curves we want to bend. Perhaps we want to understand how household dynamics and contextual factors in the environment affect increasing trends in, an ad, in, in a given adverse childhood experience or ACE or maybe an ACE profile a set of ACEs. So we wanna do this deep dive into these aspects of a family that matter most, okay? Or we might want to do a deep dive and really study how families approach supporting children's physical, social, or emotional wellness. What are the roles and responsibilities that different members of the family play? What are the resources that they really rely on? So we could start to scope out some specific um, outcome that we care about and really dig in to understand how what's happening in families or not happening in families um, affects those outcomes. Okay, so not just map the system, but really have some clear sense of what you want to improve or achieve. So to keep going with the family um, example, what does, what does the system look like that shapes outcomes? For example, if we were to pick a specific outcome like satisfaction with care coordination and supportive services, or wanting to just know how well families with kids with special health care needs are, 
are supported and how we can improve their ability to support their children, right? So we could start to think about the components. Systems thinking is trying to get us after we've kind of bounded the system to focus on, you know, their family's role in care coordination of uh, their child with special health needs. Then we can start to think about what are the components of this system? And I want you to think very broadly about these components. So there's people, who are the people that are involved that the parent has to interact with um, in this capacity and this role as supporting their child? Well, there's teachers, um, there's other pa you know, parents and caregivers, there's pediatricians and specialists, doctors that they're seeing, but there's other parts of the system too that aren't components that aren't just people. So we wanna be thinking about things like financial resources, local laws, I often talk about resources and rules, rules, um, both formal and informal. So laws are an example of a formal rule, eligibility um, criteria for a, for a program that's more formal, but there's a lot of informal rules too in our community about how we typically do things. So cultural norms um, can affect a lot of what's going on within our system and how well uh, families are supported or how they approach supporting their children with special health needs. But there's other parts of this system, too, that might feel less tangible, but are all equally important. So in the, in the system, when we think about all of the different stakeholders um, and organizations that are involved, to what extent is there goal alignment? To what extent um, are we kind of working at cross purposes versus working together? You know, um, are there warm handoffs? between the parent and different points of contact in the system? Is there trust? These things matter a lot. It's often, you know, I've heard people talk about sort of the spaces between our formal programs and services that can matter so much. And if we want to really study um, how to improve our parents, you know, the parents' um, ability, to, capacity to support their children, and, and, and if we want to think about how as a system to create better supports for them, we need to study all of this. Right? So how we look at the system, how we approach systems thinking in this, in this context, um, and, and trying to give you a sense of some of the components that we often want to think about. So my tip four in trying to keep our systems inquiry um, pragmatic is that we want to make sure that we're motivating the value of systems inquiry. We wanna make sure that anyone that's gonna get brought into a mapping method where the maps can get a little bit big or where we're gonna to try to use computer modeling to support our intuition, we need to make sure they understand why we're bringing these complex methods to bear. And so I'm gonna give you some of my tips, how I tend to talk about this, also hoping that I can convince you, um, you know, that some of the systems inquiry is worth it. So first of all, coordination is hard. You know, we, um, for a variety of reasons, have really created a, a fragmented health system. And so coordination is hard when, you know, the left hand doesn't know what the right hand is doing, right? And there's lots of reasons for these, this fragmentation. We need to make sure that if we're funded to uh, support some piece of the work, we need to show that, that we, we have to be accountable for what we are funded to do. Or if we're training people to work in a space, we need to make sure that they've got the the specific skills that they need. That's why you know, we train in disciplines. Um, so we need the siloing, but we also need to make sure that we have people who, people and methods that help see the, the holes, W-H-O-L-E-S, right? And so systems inquiry is really needed in addition to all that we're doing to strengthen the pieces to make sure that, that we have some kind of coordination especially when our change initiative is really focused on some, some kind of coordination objectives. The other motivation, another motivation for systems inquiry is, um, and we all see this happen, but there's, there's this term policy resistance. So this means when our effort, our actions are undermined by the system, wasted. And that could be because they're, um, the, the effects of what we're doing are diluted, delayed, or offset. Right, by systems, uh, by, by kind of the way the system plays out, how people react to what we're doing. Um, there's, and, and policy resistance is pervasive. So there's a wonderful article from 2006 in the American Journal of Public Health. I've got an, an abstract, a snapshot here, learning from evidence in a complex world that really describes this idea of policy resistance, where it comes from and gives lots of examples. 
We see this everywhere. And we have these ideas for change. You know, often we're kind of coming up with them um, too quickly. They're too simple, too linear, not sufficiently, you know, addressing, in, uh, acknowledging the complexity in the world. Or maybe there is something that we come up with from our perspective, the way we see the world. And if we talk with others who have different perspectives, they'll help us see how some of this might happen that we could try to anticipate. So for example, low tar and low nicotine cigarettes actually increase the intake of carcinogens. It might be a good idea to try to, to create safer cigarettes. There's a lot of uh, movement toward this um, because if people are gonna smoke, if they smoke something safer, there'll be less harm. But there's a lot of reasons why there, it's not all good. There's, there might be some bad ripple effects of this change. And what we need to be thinking about is on balance, you know, which of these win? Does the good outweigh the bad or not? So you know, an example of the bad is that if people feel like their product, their cigarettes are safer, they may be less likely to quit. Right. We also know that people, uh, there's this physiological kind of desire to, to get a certain amount of, of nicotine. So people smoke the cigarettes differently. So even though it's a low tar, low nicotine cigarette, people will smoke it a little bit differently to maintain the same level of nicotine. Right? So there's, there's lots of reasons, if we talk it out, why some of our actions aren't enough or they're not going to work as we had anticipated. And we need to take the time to really think through what we're doing, especially when we have policy resistant or persistent problems. So there's a bunch of other examples in here. Paving dirt roads in mountain areas leads to decreases in safety. Why? I and mean, people drive faster, perhaps. Maybe more, more congestion, um, more opportunities for crashes. There's all sorts of examples, but this happens all the time. And so one thing that I would encourage you to do, sorry, let me go back to this slide here. What I would encourage you to do is introduce this idea of policy resistance, that if we're not careful, that if we don't take the time to invest in the systems inquiry and having these conversations, um, that we might not, our action might not work out as we had anticipated. And a little bit more investment up front to anticipate and work around policy resistance is going to give us a much bigger impact. So if you can think of one or two concrete examples of what might undermine the impact of your change, if you can take the time ahead of, ahead of time to think of a couple of different potentially otherwise, you know, unanticipated consequences, that can go a long way toward motivating people to engage in that conversation. So two other ways that I often try to motivate the, the value of investing in systems inquiry is that fragmentation of our systems can lead to the wrong pocket problem. I think this happens a lot. And systems inquiry is really critical. It's required sometimes to motivate change. So I'm gonna show you an example here in a minute where um, it, it, we've demonstrated the, 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 the benefit of trying to increase color, colorectal cancer screening. It's a really important thing to do. It saves lives and on balance, it saves a lot of money because if we can keep people healthier, they don't get cancer and cancer treatment and survivorship care is expensive, right? But the wrong problem here is that the money that, that who pays for that intervention and who benefits their different pockets. And so sometimes systems inquiry is ne needed to help demonstrate that and negotiate some sort of change wherein everybody's better off. Um, last but not least, our intuition is often wrong when systems behave in dynamically complex systems. And you know what I mean by this is when we have change over time, we have feedback loops, we'll see examples of this all day. Um, but, but problems where, where there are, you know, again, these change over time, ripple effects, sometimes they're quick, sometimes they're long, sometimes you've got different perspectives and they're responding to changes that each other creates. Um, maps and models can really support our intuition. And so one example I like to give um, along these lines is just a really simple, this is a queuing model that I'm about to run here. It's a queuing model where we see two versions of a system, a very simple system where we are just trying to provide some service to people who arrive with a certain frequency. Um, and on the top, we have four people. On the bottom, we have five, five servers. And we can see what the impact, the differential impact is on our system outcomes, system cost, how long it takes for patients to move through this system. Um, this is a really straightforward system, but it is nonlinear in its behavior. So there, and, and so um, adding one server, 
right? Adding one server on top of the system doesn't have the same impact in all versions of the system. If we have different um, service times, it can make no difference or it can make the world of difference. And there's often tipping points in queuing systems where you can add servers and it has no effect, no effect, then all of a sudden it completely changes. You're at that tipping point where you've just added enough capacity that, that you don't have this backlog. So our systems can behave non-linearly and sometimes models can help us uh, support our intuition. And I think being able to show a simple example like this where what we're really trying to do with our simulation models is depicting the world as it is and then using this as a virtual world in which to try out different scenarios, different change scenarios. We can do this with trials, but it, it can be a lot cheaper to do this in a virtual world. So this is often good for hypothesis generation, for thinking about more broadly about what the actions are that we can undertake and then trying to get a sense of how much better they are. But I think it's really important that we try to demystify the models. And so, especially when we're, when we're working with quantitative simulation models, but this is also true of, of our qualitative system maps and the art of how we present those. But in terms of our quantitative simulation models, we wanna to try to demystify them. I think that if we, um, if we, if we have, a, a, if we show results from a model that feels really complex, it's very easy just to write off those results while the answers you know, cooked into the model. So one way that I think is really important to demystify the model is to facilitate interaction with simple before more complex versions of the model. So I'm working on a project right now. Can't read all of this. Don't worry, just kind of get a sense of the bigness of it. We're working on a project right now where we're trying to build up a model of a typical acute mental health crisis system. There are many levers that we can pull in our communities, different components of our service system that can really improve outcomes. And there are a lot of outcomes that we want to track, especially for different people who have different positions in the system. And so this is a, a model that we ultimately want users to be able to interact with where they could pull a whole slew of different levers, grow capacity in different components of the system and see how it changes trends over time. But it's really hard to step into that. So what we did was we built a much simpler version of a dashboard that we start with, right? This is, it's just got a couple of levers that we can pull and it's got four of those trends over time. Um, they're important ones, but it's not everything. And if I can start to get people to understand what's going on with the simple model, right? Then we can step more, more, you know, more, more easily into the big model. So find these baby steps. Um, and, and I think this is also true of the models that we're building and analyzing. Really try to think about what are, what are the core dynamics that people think are going on and what happens if I simulate that and then, and then layer your complexity in little bit by little bit. So a next, um, a next way that I try to demystify uh, simulation models is that you wanna be really clear about the parts of the model at a high level. And so I like to come back to this, this silly video, this simple video, um, when I'm introducing that mental health system strengthening model, right? I try to remind people that it's really not much more complex than this. The parts of the model here are people arriving into the system. So we need to say something about how often that happens. Are there important differences in those people? I've got to be able to describe the process for how they wait for service, you know, do we, do we have a fixed amount of space in a room and if somebody arrives and, the, and that's full, they're, they're just not able to get in? Or do we have a, a list that we keep and anyone can get in? How do we pull people off that, of that list? Is there a prioritization or triaging happening? So how do people arrive? How do they wait? The third part is how many, how many servers do we have? How many servers do we have? And the fourth is how long does service take? That's really it. For that big mental health system strengthening model, we have a number of different service components, but we've got to just keep specifying those four things. What, how do people arrive to the system? Right? How do they line up? How many servers, spots do we have? Beds, or it could be slots in a, in a care program. Um, and how long do we typically take one unit, you know, for one unit of service and what's the distribution of that look like? So if we can start to aid people's intuition, even if they're, we're not showing them all the details, it can go a long way toward helping them understand 
um, uh, the model and start to benefit from it, learn from it. And to this end, I also want to encourage layered documentation. So Rethink Health, I've given a link here, um, and we've got an example from some congestion pricing policy work that we did where we created a model interface online with layered documentation, you want to start at a high level trying to help people understand what's under the hood of the model the way I just talked about the, the queuing simulation model. And then you can give more detail for anyone that wants it, right? I think it can be important to make our models very transparent, their assumptions transparent because the assumptions can really matter. Um, but but it's a lot to read through all the detail at once. So try to really think about layering your documentation. Okay. Now this is um, so step tip six is make sure that whatever method that you're using in your systems mapping and modeling bring structured approaches to your systems inquiry. And I'm going to quickly talk about a handful because I, I just want to give you a sense here of the breadth of these different approaches and you're going to hear more about this in sessions later today. Again, I'm trying to point you to resources on all of these. I talked about our colorectal cancer work. This is a quantitative simulation model. Um, really what we're doing is we've got a synthetic population, state of North Carolina, based on census data. Um, that population, uh, there's a certain natural history. We understand how polyps grow, how they, you know, how they, how they appear and grow, and some, uh, some of them progress into cancer. We have spent a lot of time trying to understand how people in the current system screen, how they seek care, you know, and that's a function of over on the right, our infrastructure, our care infrastructure. And then we use this model to ask questions about what if, what if we changed our, what if we intervened in different ways? What if we um, changed insurance access? How is that going to, how is that going to change anything in this model? But we've got different pieces of this that are very structured, describing our population, describing the natural history, the progression of polyps and cancer, talking about how people currently screen, kind of the health services part of this. Um, and we can overlay these, these questions. You know, what if things change in certain ways? Um, we can, we can, um, I'm not sure if that's, oh, there may be some uh, drawing on the screen. I'm not sure if anyone can help me clear that. Um, so anyway, we can use these models to ask questions and in a more kind of structured way, try to learn about their answers. So here's a, a, one of our questions was about the cost of screening. And what we learned is that if we do in the upper left, if we remove, if we step back on ACA overall societally, it's going to, we might save money. Cost savings is above the line here. We'll save money for quite a long time. Eventually it'll start to get expensive. If we expand insurance, and specifically talking about Medicaid, um, it, will, it will cost money for a little while for the first 10 years, but then very quickly start to reap substantial benefits, cost savings in terms of avoiding cancer, cancer treatment down, downstream, and more extreme uh, insurance expansion, Medi Medicare for all is the, another scenario. It's just you're screening so many people at so many different life stages, it's instantly cost saving. But the problem is, that these cost savings, just focusing on the Medicaid expansion, are not borne by the same people that benefit. So Medicaid and dual in, duly insured, you know, Medicaid is really paying the cost for increased screening. Medicare programs are reaping the rewards, and we can use simulation models to help us quantify how much. So here's another example of using a structured systems thinking approach, causal loop diagramming. Um, and here we were trying to clarify theories of change in, in, in an initiative. There was a health impact assessment that was um, done in Baltimore and they found that and, and moved forward with the idea of trying to reduce alcohol outlet density to reduce crime and didn't have a very clear theory of change. Just the idea that in, you know, there's a lot of research that if we reduce alcohol outlets, it'll, it'll reduce crime, right? And so what we did was we used causal loop diagramming as a way to structure conversations to really understand um, why? What's the theory of change? And to really start to think about whether there might be some policy resistance in here. So we had a number of conversations in the community, first with our academic and government partners to really clarify their mental models, their understanding of how things worked, um, why they thought that, you know, this, the, the pressure to, to, there was a lot of crime that triggers a pressure to reduce crime, 
pressure to reduce crime led them to change zoning policy to reduce the number of alcohol outlets. And why they think that that's going to uh, matter is that it can decrease social disorganization and it can reduce intoxication, both of which reduce crime. But we did note, and then that will reduce police encounters. So their mental model is here. But when we talked about this with other stakeholders, we realized it's not quite this simple, especially in the context of um, low income neighborhoods. So we expanded the conversation with different community um, leaders. Here we start to see about um, you know, some of the benefits were affirmed, but also some concern about shutting down these alcohol outlets is going to lead to vacancies, which can increase crime. Um, and so that's a reason why there might be policy resistance that we might want to wrap around this zoning policy change to address. So uh, we had you know, conversations also about police encounters. Um, and then we went on to have conversations with people in the communities that were going to be affected, really wanting to use this method to get to hear their voice. So here you see, and again, I encourage you to go and look at this paper. I'm not going to do justice to this in the short presentation, but we really were able to capture the voice of our community members um, and hear from them what they thought might work and not work about this policy and what they most wished for um, to, to, really, to really see this play out in a better way. But I think having these conversations helped the community think differently about this issue and certainly helped everybody who's involved in policy change. So another reason that causal loop diagramming can be very useful is to bring structure to conversations about why we think um, a certain problem persists. So to go back to the pedestrian fatalities curve that was dropping until 2009 and back up, if you go and talk to, which we did, 30 people who are experts in this and you ask them, do we understand, you know, do, they, do, we, do they think we understand why this is happening? They will all tell you yes. And then they'll tell you a reason and those reasons are not the same. The reasons are all over the place. And so what we wanted to do here is to use causal loop diagramming to draw out people's mental models, their understanding of what's underneath this um, trend line and start to compare them, right? The best way to figure out what's going on is to really draw out what people think and then talk it out and then use that as a guide for our quantitative inquiry and hypothesis testing. So we use causal loop diagramming and here's a paper where we talk about our process to really get people to draw and to discuss and how we synthesize their, their and describe their mental models, which I think is a first critical step to being able to test them. Another structured systems inquiry that we use is system support mapping. So this is a systems thinking method that is really meant to help people, individuals over here on the left, make a map that helps them do a very deep dive, a deep dive into the purple sticky is, you know, within a given scope of work, they have to first name their role. What's their role in it? Are you a care coordinator? Are you a parent? You know, if we're trying to think about how to support kids with special health care needs, are you a, an audiologist? Are you a, you know, are you a, a local health department director? Name your role in one to four words on the purple sticky. Think about in that scope of work bounded, um, what are your primary responsibilities? These are on the blue stickies, your primary responsibilities uh, for supporting this work. And then for each of those responsibilities, kind of pushing out, we really wanna hear, capture their stories about what are some of their critical needs, most critical, most challenging needs for getting that responsibility done. We then ask them to think through in the, in the bright green and red stickies, what are the, um, what are the resources that are available to them that offset those needs? So are they, you know, if they need data, where do they get that data from? If they need a best practice, what's their repository? Where are they going to look for those? And to also assess how well those resources are currently meeting their needs. Green is yes, well, red is not well. Um, and then with all of this in mind, we ask them to tell us what they wish for to be better supported in their work. And this is really important because when you just come in and ask people what you wish for, you hear time and money, but that doesn't help us advocate for change or know how to strengthen the systems that we care about. So we have structured this inquiry, this deep dive conversation with stakeholders who have a role within a scope of work to try to get them to make these maps. And then we can analyze these maps and start to describe you know, in our system where we have a number of people that are working to support kids with special health care needs or here just looking at parents. On the bottom right, this is an aggregated look at, at the parent role. In the blue ring, we see the different responsibilities that they described. In the aqua ring, we see the needs that they named. 
in the uh, green ring, the categories of, of resources. Um, in the yellow stars, the different kind of themes of wishes. And we have all sorts of detail. We can synthesize the detail from their maps and the stories they told when they presented their maps. So there's a number of other tools that we can use. And I'm just, I'm, I'm gonna skip through this one. This is goal and action alignment mapping, which really just tries to get us when we're working on a collaboration to talk to each of our partners about their own mission, their own organizational, you know, their mission. What is critical to them? What are their pain points? And to try to help them see why, how they connect to this issue that you're working on together. Not just assuming that partners will do what we need because we need them, but to really try to step into and help them see the, the value of what we're doing to them, in their words, get inside their mental models, but also to really help us make sure that what we're asking of our partners is what they most want to contribute. So tip seven, is whenever you engage in a systems mapping or modeling initiative, make sure that you know your purpose, right? What is it that you want to illuminate? Because these methods can get complex, if we want them to feel pragmatic, you need to be very clear about what you're trying to achieve. And I would encourage you to see this work as iterative. You know, get started with something lower down in this list. Maybe we want to just figure out what a shared challenge or scope of work could look like, or to develop a shared understanding and vocabulary. Right. Um, we, there's a lot of different reasons that we might want to bring a systems inquiry uh, to, you know, to bear in our work, uh, but just get started, get working, and often we can build on that to get further down this list if we need to. But always know why you're doing this work so that you do the right things. Tip eight is get comfortable with this work being iterative, as I just described, and acknowledge that it's a process and it takes different strengths. Not everybody thinks this way. Not everybody is a natural systems thinker. And it's not that systems thinking should replace everything else that we're doing. We need all of that work to be going on. We also need systems inquiry. We need people that are seeing how the pieces interconnect. Um, but one thing that I, that I think is important to also acknowledge is that um, you know, often what happens over on the, on the x-axis here, we see time spent in systems mapping and modeling work. On the y-axis, it's, it's graphing how well people think they understand a complex issue. And what we have found over and over in our work is that often it starts out that we people think they understand things pretty well. You know, from their perspective, with their mental models, they might. What we often hear early on is that we didn't know how much we didn't know. And then we get going with our systems inquiry, and it can feel, you know, I talked about overwhelming. It can feel like like we're not ever gonna be able to make our way through this. There's so much that we don't know. And I've, I've, I have a colleague, um, Jill Kuhlberg, who talks about this as the, the pit of despair. You know, We start to realize there's so much that we need to know, but you need to just keep persisting because right through this, where you start to appreciate all the things that you didn't know you needed to know, you start to really get some rich insights. And there's a lot of learning. Uh, and with more time, you get better and better at learning how to talk about the complexity, how to streamline it. And to that end, tip nine is always have a way to distill your insights. Even though you may end up building a system map as com complex as the foresight obesity map, the big one I showed at the beginning, um, you have to have ways to distill these insights to people who, uh, to everyone, honestly, if we're trying to, to create change, we need to be able to take these insights from our systems work and distill them. So two frameworks, just two examples that I like to use are the iceberg and the bathtub. So here's an example of an iceberg where we had a lot of conversations with a number of different stakeholders to understand this problem of um, reproductive health, how better, why it's so hard to really improve reproductive health outcomes for individuals with chronic disease. So at the top of the iceberg, we have kind of indications of a problem. I'm just showing you kind of a simple a, a subset of the things that we talked about, but we've got a much more complete table like this that, that lays out the breadth of what was illuminated through these conversations. The tip of the iceberg is what's the problem, the thing that you know makes the news or keeps us up at night. The next level underneath the waterline, we're trying to understand what's been happening over time and related trends that really are affecting this, making it hard to improve in, you know, this outcome. Um, even further down, the reason that we talk about these concerning trends is that they suggest system structure flaws. We need to think about what is it in the system that needs to be improved. And at the very bottom, and probably one of the most important things for us to address, are the problematic mental models that different people carry. Because when we carry 
problematic mental models, we're influencing, we're creating system structures that are maybe making, that are often making the problems worse. So an iceberg model helps us organize our insights about the problem, the problem in context, the system structure flaws, and the problematic mental models that allow it to persist. It's a good way to take, you know, what might otherwise be in a really complex causal loop diagram and start to talk about it with others that maybe weren't part of that process. The bathtub. Um, uh, I'm, I'm so sorry to interrupt. We yeah. are out of time for this. Okay, let me, let me, so, yeah, let me just, the last sentence I'll, the say here is that the bathtub helps us think about inflows and outflows, not just what, uh, it, what uh, is happening in our population. And the last tip is that while systems inquiry may not always feel pragmatic, it is, um, it is, it is easier than the alternative. The alternative is that with all of our very different mental models and perspectives, we're trying to make, um, make, make, make decisions with all of this in our head. So I uh, just encourage you to say that to folks to have them be a little more patient with the systems inquiry. And with that, I'm all done. Sorry to run over. Thank you so much. Uh, I really appreciate your, your tips. They're very helpful. I uh, look forward to uh, digging deeper into those. Um, so we, we do have about 14 minutes until our next sessions are to start. So maybe we can take one question. Let's see, um, here's one. Do you create different system support maps for different implementer roles if you think that their different roles may require different mental models? Yes, absolutely. Um, I think it's really important. So, so we've got a project right now where we are um, studying the implementation of a complex colorectal cancer initiative multi-pronged multi in uh, community health centers. And there are a number of different uh, implementation roles. Um, and we are using system support mapping with each and really starting to hear, it's, we're, this inquiry is less about trying to understand their different mental models, though that is actually coming out. It's, it's more about trying to make sure that they are all well positioned to uh, succeed in their piece of it. And also for us as managers of this to, to see where there are gaps in the pieces, you know, again, it's often about tightening the tightening the, the connections between. I'm happy to stay on, by the way, if anybody has any follow up questions when folks go into break, I'm happy to stay on for the, the 15 minutes or whatever is helpful. Um, we have another question here. What advice do you have for working systems methods into research proposals in mm -hmm. way that are ways that are appealing to funders while adhering to systems principles? Yes, uh, it's a wonderful question. It's it's not it's not you know it's not conventional research, um, but I think it's it, it's often what we need to be doing, and it's getting easier and easier to build these methods into proposals as people get more and more comfortable with it. I think my number one um, tip is that this can feel very abstract if um, if you you know if you don't have an example to show. So in the spirit of getting started, simple and iterating, I strongly encourage you to start to build up a system map. You, know, you just have a couple conversations, get it started, because if you can have something concrete, a system diagram or a tiny simulation model that you're writing about in the proposal, it's a lot easier for somebody to get their head around what you propose doing. You know, otherwise, I, I often get told that the process sounds good, but it's a trust me application and people have a hard time you know, be feeling convinced that you can get the data that you need. But if you can have a little tiny concept model started, it goes a huge long way. Um, toward being able to explain and, and, and communicate what you're trying to do. So I can't recommend that highly enough, whether that means look for just, you know, small opportunities to do that, that pilot work first. The other recommendation is um, make sure that along the way of our system mapping, there's often a lot of more conventional research that we are doing. And so write up an aim or two that, that really answers other questions along the way, um, but then is an input to your to your system science work. So that can that can leave your, you know, your grant feeling more balanced. So I'm happy to talk more about strategies for grant writing anytime. Fantastic. Well, thank you again so much. We really appreciate this. As with all of our Coppercon uh, presentations, they'll be recorded and uh, posted on the website within the next few days, along with all of the slides. And if you're anything like me, you're gonna go back and watch this and pay attention to different things a couple different times to make sure that I'm capturing uh, the, the, the big picture of what this means, as well as the specifics about how to implement it. 
And if you want to learn more detail, we have our upcoming concurrent sessions. We have two tracks. First is our participatory and qualitative approaches in system science um, presented by Dr. Aaron Kenzie and Ellis Ballard, who will be talking about this group model building process that you described. And then in parallel, we'll also have our simulations and data analytics and system science presentations from Nassim Sabunchi and then Takabusa, if you want to get into the more data aspects of things. Uh, so, uh, not to fear, there's more details coming around how to actually implement all of this. But thank you again so much for, for being here, and we really appreciate your, your insights and wonderful expertise. Thank you, too. All right, well, we'll take about a 10-minute break, and then we'll reconvene at the top of the hour um, in our respective uh, breakout rooms.